Jeremy. Um, I am going to talk about um, uh, shared perception and memory during continuous natural events. I'm going to show you a couple of different experiments in which we use naturalistic stimuli to um, ask questions about memory retrieval. Um, and uh, our paradigm um, is very simple. Um, we just show people a movie and then we ask them to talk about it. Um, and they talk about it at some length. So throughout the um, presentation today, I'm going to be returning again and again to this idea of reinstatement. Um, so that's the notion that when you uh, remember a prior experience, you are reactivating patterns of activity that were present during the original encoding of that experience. So we look throughout the brain to um, find evidence of similarity between um, uh, activity during uh, encoding, so the movie viewing, and um, activity during recall when you're talking about those events from the movie. Uh, and then, um, you know, we have this idea that the reactivated patterns um, actually reflect memory retrieval. So I'm going to talk about uh, reinstatement. I'm going to um, then show you how these patterns can be similar across people when you have a shared um, perception and also when you have a shared memory. Uh, and um, I'm also going to um, point out in a couple of different ways how the recall behavior informs our analyses. So some of the stuff that I'm showing today is for the first time. It's like hot off the press. And um, you know it can be a bit preliminary, but I wanted to give you a kind of variety of um, approaches that we take to analyzing data like this and um, maybe uh, give you some ideas for things that you might be able to do in the um, hackathon because you're going to have access to the full Sherlock um, movie data set. Um, and recall data set. And uh, also, I'm soliciting feedback on um, analyses that we can do on our new data set, which has a couple of different properties. Okay? So the paradigm, um, people come to the scanner. Uh, they watch a movie for 50 minutes, almost an hour. Um, and that's just continuous. Um, there's no instructions other than to just watch the movie and pay attention to it as if you were watching a TV show that you really like. And then afterwards, they. Um, uh, are asked to retell the entire story in their own words. Uh, so I'm actually not going to show this demo because I think a lot of people have seen it before. Um, but Sherlock is uh, a 50 minute fairly linear narrative where each scene kind of logically follows from the one before. They go, you know, it's mostly in chronological order and then there are these buddies, Sherlock and Watson, and they have adventures. Um, I'm uh, going to show you a lot of data um, from this set and also from a new data set that I call the Film Festival. So in this data set, people, again, are watching continuously with no instructions other than to pay attention, but they watch 10 different unrelated movies. Um, and some of these are clips from longer movies, like this first one is Catch Me If You Can. Um, and some of them are uh, kind of like independent films or like short animations. They're very different. Some are animated, some are live action. Some of them, um, quite a few of them actually have no language at all. It's just music playing in the background. But of course, there are like scenarios progressing and um, each one has its own kind of character. Uh, so I, I am going to show you a demo from this. Uh, so this clip is from pretty close to the beginning of the 50 minute sequence. Uh, oh. Okay, uh, and now I'm going to play you a clip of somebody describing their memory of this video. And uh, since this video is kind of towards the beginning of the 50 minutes, it's like at minute 10, this recall takes place at least 40 minutes after. Um, and again, they're not cued with any of the individual movies. They just, they get instructions to just start um, describing anything they can remember in any order, and then they talk for as long as they want. And she puts the record on starts playing and as it starts playing she finds she's holding a slice of pizza and when she's about to put it in her mouth she finds, finds that it's like already eaten and then she realizes that it has to do with the record and so when she spins the record one way the pizza becomes whole again and then when she spins it another way it sort of shortens and so then she spins it all the way 
and all the ketones gone. Okay, so I think a pretty complete description of the um, clip that you just saw. Uh, and people spend um, anywhere from 10 to 40, 45 minutes doing this. Um, so just like in the Sherlock experiment, um, uh, people's memory is quite complete and detailed. So to analyze data like this, uh, we first have to split it into events. Um, and on Alex's question earlier, um, we just rely on what people say events are in order to do this. So um, for the Sherlock uh, movie, um, we split it into 50 scenes um, and kind of gave a name to each scene. And they're basically director's cuts. Um, and uh, for the film fest, we end up with around 70 scenes. Um, and then you go to each person's recall and listen to their audio and figure out where they're talking about each of those original scenes. And people recall, on average, around 30 of the 50 Sherlock scenes and proportionally similar for the film festival. Um, and the idea here is that you're going to be linking um, each event from the movie to each um, event uh, from a person's recollection. So uh, here's a way that we um, look at the behavior for uh, an example subject. So on the y-axis, you have the time during the movie starting at zero at the top. And then on the x-axis, you have the time during recall for this person. So every event is um, a box on this um, diagonal. Uh, and the height of the box tells you how long that scene was during the movie. The width tells you how long it was during the uh, took for that person to describe it. And you can see that um, you know, the boxes are uh, kind of falling along the diagonal. So this person is recalling things mostly in order. And when you see a box that's off of the diagonal, it means that they recalled that one out of order. Uh, and this is the kind of behavior that you see during Sherlock. Um, for the film festival, we get a different kind of behavior. So to orient you here, um, each one of the colored um, horizontal bands is a different one of the 10 movies. Um, and uh, the yellow boxes in there are the scenes as people recall them. So um, let's see, is this the pointer? Yeah. So the way to read this is, remember, um, we're going in the order of uh, the recall that this person performed. And so they first recalled the last movie, um, and then they recalled the second movie, and then this one here like this. So they're bouncing around in time. And their instructions are to recall them in any order they want. Um, so. Uh, Th this is what you get. I think um, I think it's like an interesting piece of behavior to begin with. So obviously, within each little story, people are giving you a fairly um, accurate temporal reconstruction of the events. But the uh, the movies are unrelated to each other. They don't logically connect. And so when they remember them, people don't necessarily remember them in the original order that they were presented. Uh, and so to show you this in more detail, here's eight different subjects in Sherlock. Um, this guy down here is the most out of order one that we had in the set of 17. So you can see it's pretty um, ordered um, across people. And here's a similar example from the Film Fest. Um, so you do get people who recall things um, mostly in order or even like runs of things that are in order. But uh, you see that there's a lot of variability across subjects um, in terms of what order they happen to remember or choose to describe the different um, movies. So um, I'm not going to be showing you more analyses of temporal order. I'm sorry to people who are temporal contiguity aficionados. Um, but obviously, I'm interested in this. Um, so I'm inviting um, ideas about how to do these analyses. I will say that uh, the order with which people recall the 10 movies is significantly similar across subjects. But I think it's mostly driven by the first move, by primacy, basically. So we should redo the analyses just taking out the first movie. Um, there are like some movies that tend to be recalled um, back to back, uh, and some of it comes from there. But you know, the the way that I think about this data is that each one of the movies is kind of this little neighborhood in your memory space or your conceptual space, and you follow some kind of trajectory as you visit these um, during your recall. So trying to predict the um, parameters of that trajectory is really the goal of uh, collecting this data set. I will return to this data set at the end of the talk, um, but. Uh, for the middle of the talk, we're going to do analyses um, on the Sherlock data set, and then you know, the same ones can be applied to the FilmFest data set. I'll show a bit of it. All right, so to analyze the brain data for both of these data sets, um, we're going to look at similarity between patterns during perception, during the movie, um, and during uh, the spoken recall, um, scene by scene. So you just take a 
um, little piece of the brain uh, and uh, unwrap those voxels um, into a matrix. So you have voxels on the y-axis there and time on the x-axis. And you get the data for um, each individual movie scene and then each um, uh, scene during recall um, of the movie scene, so during the speech. And you just, in this first pass analysis, we're just averaging across time to get a single vector of values for each movie scene and one for each recalled scene. And then you calculate the correlation between those. Um, so you do this at each um, individual scene in the uh, recall, um, and then to um, assess your uh, uh, noise baseline, you just look at the correlation between random scene pairs. Um, and do this in every region of the brain um, as a searchlight. So what you get here um, is a map of all of the regions where you had similarity between movie and um, uh, individual movie events and the um, brain patterns at the time that they were recalling that event. Okay. And uh, the regions that you see are these kind of long time scale, um, high level regions that Chris was talking about earlier regions in the default mode network, angular gyrus, posterior medial cortex, medial PFC, um, dorsal PFC, perihippocampal cortex. Um, to to uh, get a sense for the robustness of this effect, I can show you the individual 17 subjects in posterior medial cortex. So um, you actually see this reinstatement effect um, in every subject. And then the um, map that I'm showing you is the group level map. Um, Oh, and this is the same map in the film fest data. So this is irrespective of the fact that a lot of the events occurred out of order. You can still compare um, movie scenes to recall scenes and get essentially the same map. All right, so here we saw that um, during this kind of free spoken recall of a prior experience, um, where there were no cues at all, people just talk for like half an hour, you see neural patterns that are reactivated scene by scene. Um, you don't need to do that because you do the calculation independently for every scene and then average. Yeah. So the order is gone in that analysis. Yeah. Uh, and we saw that reactivation throughout the default mode network, um, but not in lower level sensory areas like visual cortex and auditory cortex. Even though, of course, the sensory areas are um, being driven reliably during the movie, they're not being driven reliably during recall um, because uh, well, they're, they're not reliable across subjects during recall because everybody is saying whatever they want to say. Um, and each scene is also taking a different amount of time to recall for each person. Um, OK, so uh, the next analysis that we're going to do, I think, is more challenging. Um, so as, as I just said, uh, people um, say whatever they want to say um, during the recall, and uh, we just kind of have to live with it. So each subject describes the movie in their own words and the amount of time that they take talking about each scene, an individual scene can vary a lot. Um, and the details that they recall um, also differ across subjects. So to dig into this a little, I'll show you an example of um, different people describing the same scene uh, in the Sherlock movie. So uh, this is the scene um, where Sherlock is introduced and he's in a morgue and he's like, he's got a writing crop and he's whipping a dead body with it, you're not really sure why. Um, and there's also a girl there that is kind of trying to interact with him and it's, you know, not going that well. So this person says, uh, he brings them to a morgue, Sherlock Holmes is whipping a dead body. I don't know why, I guess he's looking and wondering about the bruising pattern. Quite a short description of this scene that was originally almost a minute long. Um, and then here's another person. So she says, we see him in a morgue or a crime lab and he's talking to a lab technician who has a crush on him and he doesn't pick up on her cues. So that first person didn't even bother to mention that there is another person in that scene. Um, this person remembers that there's actually kind of a complex social interaction where there's a lab tech who's trying to flirt with Sherlock and um, he's, uh, according to this person, not picking up on her cues. And then here's another description of the same scene. I'm not going to read you this whole thing, but in the red, um, uh, talking about the girl, she's clearly trying to ask him out and he hardcore rejects her and she asks if he wants to get coffee later and he's like, yeah, black one sugar. So th this is actually a slightly different interpretation of the scene where Sherlock, um, it's not that he isn't picking up on her cues, he's picking up on the cues. He's just trying to let her know maybe in a mean way that he's not interested. Um, and uh, these are three quite different descriptions of the same scene is the point. But uh, there's some similarities as well. So if you um, look at what people say, 
the behavior. Everybody um, mentions where uh, this scene is. It's in the morgue. And that Sherlock was there and uh, what he was doing there. And everybody um, uh, at least takes a guess at, what, uh, at why he's doing it. Uh, and two of these people at least remember that there is another person in the scene and what, their, um, what that person's interaction with Sherlock was. So there are these kind of key elements of the scenario or situation that uh, kind of make it what it is. You know, if you tried to swap out um, one of the people or the location or the goals in this um, scene, you might um, reasonably call it a different scene. Okay? So there's some basic elements. Uh, and um, now we can ask, when we go to the brain data, um, do we find pattern similarity when we look directly between subjects who are recalling the same scene, even though they're all saying something different? So it's the same analysis. Um, we're taking the voxel um, patterns from uh, an individual scene and comparing them this time to another person, or in this case, the average of all of the other subjects. Um, and we do that scene by scene, and we also check uh, what it looks like when you just use random scenes. And uh, here you find uh, similarity between subjects in a lot of the same regions. So um, uh, posterior medial cortex and um, lateral parietal cortex and perihippocampal cortex, default mode regions. Um, and uh, again, uh, here are the individual subject um, values for the posterior medial cortex. So you're seeing the similarity between subjects in every person. Uh, now, it's, it's really important to remember that the um, patterns for individual scenes um, are discriminable. So it's not just the case that everybody is performing recall. And so there's similarity across people because they're doing the same task, right? Each scene has um, a discriminable pattern. So we can recast this as a classification problem and say, um, if we take uh, half of our subjects and the other half of the subjects, and we just take the scene pad, like scene one from group one, and then we try to locate that scene just using correlation um, in the other group, totally independent group of subjects. How well can we actually say that was scene one as opposed to one of the other 50 scenes? Um, during recall, uh, with a chance level of uh, 3%, um, we can do that uh, at about 16% accuracy. And during the movie, it's even much higher, close to 30, 35, 36% accuracy on a 2% chance level. So there, there are definitely discriminable patterns. There's there's going to be similarities between different scenes as well, especially if their content is similar, most likely. Um, but you have um, substantial discriminability of the individual patterns here in posterior medial cortex and in many other regions. So here I've showed you that um, when different subjects are verbally recalling the same movie scene, um, you see this similar and also scene-specific neural activity um, in direct uh, correlations between brains. Um, and you see that throughout the default mode network, but not in the lowest level sensory areas again. So, um, you know, one of the questions that uh, often comes up here is what are the stimulus features that um, are driving these scene-specific neural patterns? Um, and uh, one of the ways that we uh, approach this um, is uh, we take an encoding model approach. You go to the movie and uh, label lots of different stuff about it. So here, um, the regressors are shown in columns, and I don't know if you can see at the bottom there what they are, but um, this, so these are the 50 scenes of the movie, and um, we've split the movie into 1,000 segments, uh, and then for each segment we rate, uh, we either, we, we label, um, so here, whether there are people speaking, how many people are um, present on the screen at that moment, what location it is, the arousal level of valence, whether it's indoor, outdoor music, um, whether Sherlock is there, whether John is there, whether there are written words. And you can, you know, you can come up with a whole grab bag of like different things that you um, want to score about the movie. Then go to the, um, the uh, scene level and say for any individual scene, we can now get a score on that label. Um, and um, build a model uh, to try to train on half of the, the scenes, or sorry, to train on 48 of the scenes, um, a model to try to predict brain activity in any given region, um, and then test on the two held out scenes whether you can identify um, the pattern. And so when we do that, we can achieve pretty decent classifier um, accuracy around 70% on a 50% chance level. And um, this is using, this is using um, all of the uh, labels. So um, what we do here is say, uh, you start with one label and find the one that uh, works the best. And then you add um, 
each individual label to it um, to find the one that's the next best, and you build up until um, you reach your peak performance. And then as you add more and more um, predictors to the model, then it starts to overfit. So this is another piece of information you can get, is what are, for any given region, what are the um, predictors that actually matter for the uh, signal in that area? Um, what order are those predictors in, right? How much of the variance do they explain? And then what are these extra ones? Uh, so that's just a preliminary analysis. Um, another thing that um, we're very interested in here is what are the spatial scales of this brain activity that's common across people? So, uh, you know, anatomical core registration being what it is, it can only be so good. And so you know um, just by thinking about it that the uh, signal that is shared across people has to be spatially coarse, pretty coarse. Uh, and I'm just going to show you um, kind of visually what it looks like. These, these are... Um, bold maps, not correlation maps, uh, for two, the two um, groups of subjects, independent groups um, from the Sherlock movie. So I'm going to play this, and for each frame of this movie, you're going to be seeing the midline activity for the two independent groups, um, uh, one scene at a time. And the thing to look for is that visually, um, you have uh, similar activity patterns in the two different groups. And so that tells you that um, the signal that you're seeing is driven by the stimulus. It's not random. Um, and the other thing to look at is the scale of the activity, which is pretty coarse. Right? So you see these big gradients um, across regions of the brain. Um, we're kind of uh, overestimating the smoothness here because I've z-scored across the entire image. Um, if you zoom in on an individual region, you can see that there's a finer scale of activity here. But it's still pretty coarse. So, you know, Nobody is saying that there is not information at the finer scale. Obviously, there is a lot of information at the finer scale. Um, but there's also a lot of information at the coarser scale, enough for us to do pretty decent classification of individual scenes in the movie. So I think like an important question going forward is what kind of information lives at these different spatial scales of activity? Um, OK. So uh, I told you about reinstatement, um, where you reactivate patterns um, from your past experiences when you remember them. And uh, one uh, interesting road that this leads down is that um, reinstatement obviously is imperfect. So, uh, you know, we didn't see reinstatement everywhere in the brain. And then where we did, there was plenty of room um, uh, of uh, uh, unexplained um, signal. Um, but I, I want to talk about uh, how this imperfect uh, reinstatement actually may be systematic. So a memory system that records perception perfectly wouldn't um, be very good, actually. So memories actually benefit by being transformed from perception. They can be compressed, um, so that can be efficient. Um, they can be associated with your existing knowledge, um, which is important if you want to retrieve them. Um, and they can be generalized to similar situations. So you can uh, you know, ha have this experience um, where uh, somebody, your friend goes on vacation and they bring back like a thousand pictures for you to look at. Um, and that's not very useful. What's more useful is if they show you a few key images that kind of give you a sense for um, the culture of that region that they visited or the geography or the um, good food that they ate there. Um, so this kind of compression and smart um, selection is an important aspect of organizing our memories. Um, we have a trick for looking for this in the brain. So. Um, imagine that you have your perception and um, people um, ha recall it in different ways. So one way um, that they could recall it is each person remembers some uh, part of the perception. You know, so it's lossy, um, uh, lossy reactivation, and it's a kind of uh, uh, random um, the ways in which uh, people's memories differ from perception. But another way could happen is that people um, don't recreate the perception, the percept um, perfectly when they recall it, but they uh, have a systematicity in the parts that they remember um, and the parts that they forget. So um, we look for this um, uh, in the brain by asking um, where are different people's recall patterns more similar to each other than they are to their own original um, movie pattern. Right? So if each person is changing in a different way, then they can't be more similar during recall than they are to the original movie. But if each person is changing somewhat in the same way, then you can actually find that recall patterns are more similar across people than they are to the movie. 
So when we look in the brain for that pattern, we find um, a set of high level regions. Interestingly, they're not um, like quite core default mode. They're a little bit um, peripheral and in the high level visual areas. Um, but uh, you know, we have this candidate set of regions where um, uh, patterns seem to be changing in a systematic way. And actually this um, map replicates pretty well in the film test data too. Um, the uh, question I asked originally was whether this kind of transformation might actually be useful. Um, so we can go to the behavior uh, and show that um, this is posterior medial cortex. Um, the amount of transformation scene by scene is actually related to um, the likelihood of people recalling that scene. So there is some evidence of a benefit to memory when um, the uh, recall pattern has been transformed in a systematic way across people. Um, another way that we're trying to approach this again from the angle of behavior is to take a closer look at what people actually say during memory. Um, so, you know, the analyses that we did before involved collapsing um, across time, averaging down into a single vector everything that people said about an individual scene. But there's a lot of rich behavior that we would like to take advantage of. Um, and if you think about what might be changing between the movie and the recollection, an obvious candidate is compression. So it does not take most people the full 50 minutes to recall a 50 minute movie. They can do it in about 10 or 20 minutes. Um, so something seems to be getting squeezed. Um, and uh, we thought we would look in the behavior to see if we can find that. So um, this really jumps out when you read people's or listen to people's um, recordings as well. There are some statements that are really summaries of a pretty long period of time uh, or an entire scene or more. Um, and there are some statements that are really precise recall. So they lock to individual um, events. We just um, cut this off at 10 seconds. So the way that we scored this was if the sentence, we split it up into sentences and then we said, for that sentence, are they talking about events in the movie that spanned more than 10 seconds or can be pinpointed to an under 10 second window? That's how we did it. Um, and there's also a lot of things that people say that don't fall into those categories. So people have commentary, there are thoughts and opinions about the movie and the characters and also stuff that's kind of meta, like um, I can't remember the next part. Um, but if you just look at the breakdown of uh, what people do, uh, most of the time, most of the utterances that they make are this kind of precise recall, um, but there's a substantial number of summary statements as well. Uh, so. Uh, the first analysis that we did um, was to go to the movie data and ask um, if we compare the subjects to each other. So each one of these little diagrams is a scene and then uh, it's a subject by subject correlation matrix. So we're just, uh, it's not correlation, sorry, it's a, it's a correspondence between subjects in terms of how much they summarize that scene, right? So we're going to uh, ask during the movie, um, can we predict um, from that similarity to other subjects, whether they're going to um, recall uh, the scene, sorry. Yeah, we're asking, does the similarity between you and another person in terms of how much you summarize that scene um, predict uh, your brain similarity pattern in the posterior medial cortex? And this is a very preliminary analysis, but it's looking kind of promising that um, you, can, you can do that analysis on the movie data. So this is like before you even produce the recall behavior. Um, then we can go to the recall um, and ask, so when you were actually doing um, this uh, recollection, can we just take the summary and precise statements and um, tell uh, from the state of your brain um, which one you're doing? Are you engaging in summary recall or, or precise, temporally precise recall? Um, and we can find um, uh, throughout a lot of the default mode network, we can tell the difference between those two kinds of statements. This, this is also preliminary. It's just done um, using simple correlation and the values are pretty small. Um, but I think that we can do a lot better um, using an act, like printing an actual classifier on this data. Uh, and finally, um, the question I originally posed um, uh, um, about whether there's a relationship between the transformation um, and behavior. So, if you look uh, scene by scene, 50 scenes on the x-axis, um, you can see that there's variability uh, in terms of um, how much each scene is summarized. So we can just get a score for every scene um, for all of the subjects together. Uh, did that scene tend to be summarized um, by people or did it tend to be precisely recalled? 
Um, and then if we look in the posterior medial cortex, we can find a relationship um, between the amount of um, summarization that that scene experienced in the behavior and the transformation magnitude. So how much at the group level that um, brain pattern during recall was changed from the movie. Um, this is a, you know, a modest correlation, but I think the right way to do this analysis is actually to look everywhere in the brain um, and characterize uh, for different kind of event um, duration, like how robust is this effect throughout the map um, to uh, changes in the exact event boundaries um, and the kind of scoring systems that we use for summary, because none of those are like gold, you know. Um, there's a bit of subjectivity in event boundaries, more than a bit, um, and so you want to see that this correlation doesn't depend um, on the specific parameters that you chose for, uh, for that scoring. Uh, but I think this is promising, um, promising uh, to the idea that the amount of transformation that we find in the brain pattern between encoding and recall is related to the precision and compression of the memory um, that we observe in the behavior. Okay, uh, last section here. So um, I told you about that kind of imperfect reinstatement where the uh, memory pattern has actually been changed from the perception pattern um, in a potentially useful way. Uh, there's another way that um, reinstatement is imperfect that's maybe a bit more obvious, um, which is that uh, remembering what you've seen and reporting it is not always uh, that easy. So this is kind of a long demo, but since we're among friends, I'm gonna go just to go for it. And I have to do clicking because it was actually too long to animate properly. You can hear the scanner in the background. I tell them to tell me when they're done. <laughs> okay, so the point is that um, during the film festival um, uh, recall, we got a lot of um, these kinds of long search periods, and that was um, one of the reasons that we ran the experiment in the first place, was to try and make recall more difficult. You know, during the Sherlock experiment, um, Everything is, uh, th there's not a lot of pausing like this at all during Sherlock. As I said, each scene follows the next one and it's kind of in a logical order and you cue yourself as you go. Um, but in the film festival experiment, you um, cue yourself a bit within a movie, but when you get to the end, you often are a bit lost like this. Um, this is definitely one of the longer pauses, but um, you know, almost everybody has a couple of trials um, like this. Uh, and you know, to look at that in the diagram that I showed you before, it would manifest as these gaps in between little runs of remembering something about a movie and then there's this time where you're searching your memory, doing who knows what, um, visiting the neighborhoods of the different movies potentially, or maybe searching a larger space, trying to go into places in your memory that you haven't already recently visited. Um, and eventually you hit uh, something that uh, you recognize as uh, you're supposed to be talking about it. So um, uh, we did a little bit of analysis of this. So we had people um, score, like listen to the audio, trend, the audio recordings very carefully and 
pull out all of the moments where it seemed like people were doing memory search, you know? So for the long ones, it's really obvious, like what I just played for you. I also had them just pick out anything that seemed like a hesitation or um, not necessarily in between movies. Even within an individual movie, you might be struggling to remember the next event. So um, this is a histogram across all of the subjects. Um, and you can see, of course, that most of the um, pauses are short, and I'm not going to um, analyze those um, in the data I'll show you next. So the first bar is gone. But you still have uh, you know, a healthy number of trials where people are um, waiting, uh, are, are searching their memories for 10 seconds or maybe up to um, more than a minute uh, for whatever it is that they're going to talk about next. And um, the very first test analysis that we do on this is to ask, um, whether we can decode from the brain activity which movie you're going to talk about next. Okay. So to unpack this slide, um, the memory search period is here, and this is collapsing over many different trials. And so there are like, not that many trials out here. And then as you progress towards um, this direction, there are more and more trials being added to the, um, to the lines. Um, and then this is the onset of the next movie. And so the pink line is showing you the correlation of your brain activity at this time during your recall with the um, movie pattern of the movie that you're going to recall in the future. Is that clear? And, and this um, stuff back here is uh, you describing the previous movie. So it's basically your baseline. Um, and what you see is that um, as you enter the memory search period, there's kind of nothing, nothing, but then you lift off. <laughs> and um, you can start to um, uh, uh, see similarity between your recall pattern and the upcoming movie that you're going to remember about 30 seconds into the future. Um, so, uh, you know, the, as I said, there's a small number of trials here, but I think it's promising um, to the idea that you can, uh, you can, tell what's coming pretty far in the future. What it suggests, if you think about the neighborhoods analogy again, um, is that even before you really feel like you have remembered the next movie, you're already going in the right direction. You're approaching the neighborhood. You, so your trajectory, if we were able to plot it, should look like you're uh, um, heading towards uh, the neighborhood of your target memory. And some of the questions that I want to ask with this data are, um, how much do we wander during memory search? So are you revisiting the neighborhoods that you were before? Are you intentionally going to a new one and trying to get away from the stuff that you already talked about? Um, is there an event horizon for recollection? So is it the case that if you get close enough to your target memory, you are going to remember it? And how big is that um, radius? Um, and does it vary across people? And um, how do we know when we're done? So I didn't show you in the histogram. Everybody has a very, very long search period at the very end of their recall because they have to decide that they're done. Um, and I think there's a, a interesting questions to ask there too. Like, so do you revisit all of the memories that you um, already talked about? Um, and then maybe there's some kind of uh, proportion of that area that you cover and then you decide, well, I guess I'm done. Uh, so I think open questions um, that we hope to address with this data set and maybe follow up data set. Okay, so uh, I talked about um, these paradigms where we have people watching a movie and then engaging in this free spoken recall um, and tried to give you some uh, of a flavor of the different kinds of analyses that we can do um, with naturalistic stimuli like this. Um, so we talked about uh, event level reinstatement that we observed throughout the default network and the direct similarity between people um, when they're doing this kind of recall. Um, and uh, also about the systematic changes that we see. So this transformation between the patterns at encoding of the movie um, uh, to the time of recollecting um, those events um, and how maybe there's a kind of compression or efficient coding of the information and memory that might be in the service even of communicating to other people. Um, beautiful work by Asya Zabud that I didn't have a, a chance to go over today, but you should go read her paper on it. Um, and finally, I'm very interested in looking at brain, di brain dynamics during memory search um, and uh, potentially relating it to um, you know, extensive work on um, kind of word list uh, recall and temporal order effects. Uh, so thanks to the many, many people who contributed to this work. Um, Yuan Chang now at Stanford um, 
and uh, Chris and Esther and Uri and Ken all on the um, Sherlock project. Asse, who I mentioned working on the uh, memory construction and communication um, project that I didn't have a chance to talk about. And Yunjin and Lisa Hopkins, who um, did a lot of the analyses on the new data set I'm talking about today. Thanks. And we're going to go into the tutorial next, so, um, but I'll mention the tutorial already contains uh, two ROIs worth of data. Um, that was the 250 odd megabytes that you downloaded already from GitHub. But um, the whole brain data set in Nifty format is available there at Princeton. And then the MATLAB version of it is available at Datalad from last year's um, mind for people who use MATLAB. That's a, good, a great question. Um, so the figure that I showed there actually is to the, it's compared to the first segment of the next movie. We did it all of the ways that you're imagining. So you can average across the whole movie. You can use the, we actually have the Film Fest data segmented at finer and coarser levels. So you can like choose how much of the beginning you want to um, go to. It, I think it, in the, it doesn't affect the basic result that much, but I think it makes the most sense to, um, ask for reinstatement of the beginning of the next movie. Um, yeah. Different versions of that would yeah, are you, are you trying to recall the center of the neighborhood or like the beginning point where you're gonna start talking? Yeah. Um, yes, we did them all. <laughs> Yeah, we haven't done it. No, it's a great idea to actually just use the labels that we already built an encoding model from and try to predict summary versus precise behavior instead of the brain pattern. Yeah, no, it's, it's low hanging fruit. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Um, I don't think that um, I can disentangle those at all in this data. Um, I think that, you know, we do see uh, these kinds of more, like, so RSC and PMC, like, come up to get, I mean, I say PMC because I'm not trying to differentiate PCC from precuneus or from RSC. They, like, all come up together. Um, and I think people are doing imagery during this task. You know, we don't um, give very detailed instructions on what they should do. We say you're retelling the events that, you know, the, the, the story basically, and you're retelling the plot. Um, I do think that if you give people instructions to recall um, things more visually, you probably would push reinstatement down into lower level, um, high level visual areas, lower than what we see in these maps. So one of the things, um, that I hope to do with the Film Fest data set actually is that all of the people in, no, 10 of the people in that data set also have retinotopic mapping. Um, and so we can, in the, uh, the one person in the Sherlock data set that did, I, I did look to see how far down the reinstatement effects go, and they basically come down to the border of PHC1 and PHC2. So there's, it's down into the kind of contested zone between memory and perception. <laughs> um, and I, I definitely think that if you're giving people instructions to do more visual imagery, you're gonna be able to push it down further. So it's more of a, a question of what you're asking people to do. Um, and in this case, we just kind of let them uh, give us stuff at a very high level, yeah. Question?
Yeah, it's a good question. I, um, the temporal uh, distance, I think, is not a good predictor um, of confusability. So if you just look at the pattern correlation matrix, um, uh, which I don't have an example of, but like you, you, that would manifest as a kind of halo around the diagonal, right? Um, and getting less and less uh, similarity as you go out. It does not look like that at all. It looks like a total patchwork. Um, but the semantic relationship of the scenes, I think, definitely plays a role. So we did do an analysis a long time ago, like kind of more classic ROSA style, where you look at, you rate, you score similarity between the different scenes on different dimensions, and then see if you can predict um, uh, similarity between the brain patterns. Um, so that can that works a little. So uh, the the, I think the best example of it is we actually took. Um, what people say during the recollection and just um, do like a LSA to see, uh, to calculate a similarity in the actual words that they use. Um, and then you can just a little bit predict uh, similarity in the brain patterns from that. So I think like it's not anywhere near to the whole story, but there's uh, more um, evidence for semantic similarity driving the um, neural pattern similarity than temporal. Although in the Film Fest recall, we're going to um, have a better opportunity to dissociate these two. Thanks for the brief talk. I, I always find your analysis really creative. I was wondering if you had ratings for the Film Fest data set about how much people liked individual movies and hmm. what kind of effect they or how they were correlated. The only behavioral ratings I have. Um, uh, from the subjects are uh, how similar they thought the movies were to each other. So I have them fill out a similarity matrix. Um, but I don't have ratings of uh, each individual's uh, liking of the, of the movies. Of course, I'm collecting all kinds of ratings on the movies from um, other raters. You know, so you can rate all of the, the 10 features that I showed you and many more. But um, from the actual subjects, only the similarity matrix. Uh, there's about five minutes in between. So, so um, as for how much time it takes, I guess I think that's how much time it takes. Uh, you know, the transformation is really kind of functional in the sense that um, it's whatever people choose to report and what they happen to reactivate, right? So, right. Yeah. But, but you could have very different things occurring sort of during the encoding of the movie that contribute to what you would recall and mm -hmm. Yeah, no. Period that might have very no, that's a that's a really good point. I think I think that the transformation process actually does begin during encoding, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, of course, it's that is a very hard thing to study. Like, you know, it it suggests analyses uh, between levels of the hierarchy, maybe um, looking at transformation between lower level sensory areas and then the um, uh, patterns that you see in higher level areas. But you know, I I think about that question a lot, but um, I don't have a way to address it here. So, if this wasn't clear, this was in MATLAB, which is 